Before I begin, I just wanted to um, say that I was very, uh, I found uh, last uh, period's lecture with uh, David Swenson very interesting. Also, I liked being serenaded by New Blue, which is the first experience for me. <laughs> um, but uh, Swenson, um, he gave, a, I thought, a very interesting uh, talk. Because I've heard him talk before, but it's always interesting. Um, he, t he, he really emphasized diversification. Um, but, you know, I, I don't know what you were thinking. We got a 28% portfolio return last year. There's something else going on besides diversification, right? <laughs> diversification means you get the average return. Um, and I was glad that you asked questions at the end. Some of your questions seem to draw out other things that he doesn't plan uh, to talk about, uh, like what he really did to make money. <laughs> and so um, one thing was that he said that they shorted the internet stocks in the late 1990s. That's a brilliant market timing uh, device that I, I think enlightened people thought that those prices were getting high. Uh, and also made some play on credit spreads, uh, and now on uh, real estate, he said. So uh, how does he do it? Uh, again, uh, it's my theory that there's no, you can't entirely be taught. But uh, partly, though, I think that he does it, and as do other uh, good portfolio managers, by just keeping a very broad base of knowledge and listening to people and uh, collecting information and watching the big trends and thinking about them. Uh, so one of, I think, uh, Swenson's best talents is his, he's a good listener. And he incorporates uh, <coughs> basic facts and acts on them. So you might have, it would be incorrect, I think, in listening to what he said to conclude that he just says, diversify. Uh, because he's obviously done something very different from that. So, um, by the way, I have another speaker who told me that he would like to talk to our class, and I hope we can work it out. Uh, his name is Carl Icahn, who is uh, one of the biggest uh, Wall Street, uh, uh, powerful uh, and enlightened people on Wall Street, who can also maybe tell us something about how he makes money. <laughs> But, uh, or, or how he makes it a better world. Uh, but the problem is that he has a, you know, these people have very tight schedules. And he's involved in various takeovers and things right now. Uh, so um, he said um, he could do it if we could arrange to meet after 3 p.m. Um, so uh, I'm going to, is that a, 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 on a Monday or Wednesday perhaps at a 3 p.m. Uh, or, or later? He said it might even, uh, his assistant said it, it might even be 7 p.m. <laughs> so that's the way he worked. I don't think he gets up at 9 a.m. apparently. Um, so um, uh, I take that that's all right with you, that you can come to a special uh, section of this class. But we have to uh, see if we can arrange that. Uh, and, you know, again, I don't guarantee that it will happen because uh, the reality is someone who's involved in as many things as he is. It's going to be something. To, um, but we do have uh, Stephen Schwartzman coming um, February 22nd. And, uh, um, and we have uh, Andrew Redleaf coming March 5th. So uh, uh, we have a really strong set of uh, outside speakers uh, this year. And again, uh, the, the midterm exam is Monday. Uh, sorry that I misstated that last week. Uh, but you've already seen last year's midterm, and it's going to look a lot like that. Uh, uh, OK. So, uh, so we're talking today about interest rates uh, and uh, uh, bonds. Interest rates uh, are an old, old thing. They go back to ancient times. Um, but uh, I'm going to talk about some of our modern institutions. And um, I'm going to talk first about discount bonds. This is a little bit more of a technical lecture, um, but um, I find it just as interesting myself. <laughs> as, uh, but we're, we're talking about discount bonds uh, and then uh, coupon-carrying bonds. 
uh, and then uh, talk about the term structure of interest rates uh, and uh, why, why we have interest rates. Uh, I think that's my Blackberry beeping. I'm trying not to live in too electronic a world. <laughs> and, uh, that's the way it is these days. Okay. Uh, it's, just beep it's giving its last, <laughs> last gasp. <laughs> uh, and then uh, finally talk about uh, inflation index bonds. So, um, okay, uh, the first uh, thing is, um, is a, uh, a discount bond. It's the most sim simple. Uh, or often called a bill. Uh, a discount bond uh, does not pay interest. It's sold at a discount. Okay, so you have the principal, uh, which is the amount owed, uh, which is, let's say it's $100. Uh, and that will be uh, paid to you at some date in the future, specified in the contract. Uh, and uh, n uh, n nothing, you would just get $100. But, but you get, effectively, you get interest from this because it's sold at a discount. So the price that you pay is equal to 100 minus the discount. All right. So you wouldn't buy this bond at at par because uh, at par meaning at a hundred dollars because then you wouldn't get any interest on it. So you buy it at a discount, uh, and uh, and that uh, and that uh, the the return you get is of course a hundred minus uh, uh, yeah the, the return you get is the discount. Okay. So um, the U.S. government is a big issuer of discount bonds, and they're called treasury bills. So I have them up on the screen here. Um, this is from a U.S. government website called uh, treasurydirect.gov, uh, and you can get on and access it at any time. Um, and it is showing since the U.S. government issues these bonds, it, it, it's showing its data on these bonds. Uh, the bonds are auctioned off on regular dates, uh, and uh, you cannot participate in the auction. I, I assume you can't. You'd have to be an authorized participant, but if you become an institution, you can get authorized to trade in the, in the auction. So these are the dates. The, the latest auction. Uh, was uh, February 14. Uh, I guess that was yesterday, right? Uh, and the, the, the term means it was a 60-day uh, Treasury bill. That means it pays uh, not $100. Uh, it would start at $10,000. Uh, treasury bills, you have, you, maybe you have to realize there's a distinction between savings bonds and Treasury bills. Treasury bills are for serious investors. And so they don't come in small denominations. The U.S. government also issues small denomination debt uh, to individuals to help them, called uh, savings bonds. Uh, but uh, we aren't talking about those. Uh, so um, at the uh, February 14th auction, uh, treasury bills were 60-day treasury bills were sold. Uh, and the, the auction price is given, well, here's the price of the bill. Uh, the issue date was uh, today, uh, February 15, uh, and they mature in what should be exactly 60 days in April 15. Um, so uh, if you want to buy one, you would pay this price. This number, QSIP number, is a number uh, which identifies any security. It's like you have a social security number or other ID number, which positively, and there might be another person with the same name as you, 
God forbid, <laughs> but you at least have a, your own number, which is guaranteed to be identical, uh, unique to you. So every security has an identical QSIP, which identifies it. Um, so I wanted just to start by uh, explaining the numbers here. Uh, and um, how do they get, how, how do these numbers interrelate? Uh, okay. Uh, okay. Well, um, the, this, uh, the discount rate is, is sort of the interest. You notice there's two different interest rates here, and you might be confused by them. Uh, the discount rate uh, that is shown uh, is the number that you plug in to a formula to get the price. What really matters to you as an investor is how much you have to pay today to get $100 uh, in, in 60 days. Okay. Uh, so how do we get the price uh, from the discount rate? Uh, well, there's an, a formula that's been used um, by, um, by uh, bond traders for uh, hundreds of years, uh, and it, it's a traditional expression which goes from the discount rate to the price. Uh, and in this case, the price is 99.58. And what does that equal? It equals 2.51. That's the discount rate that you see up there, about 2.510, um, times 60 divided by 360. Okay. Uh, as you know, there's the thing: the maturity is 60 days, and as you know, there are about 360 days in a year, and so. Uh, by tradition, they divide by 360, not 365. Um, and so you understand that uh, dealers tend to, of treasury bills, tend to quote discounts. Uh, that's a way, it's like a language, a language of finance, okay? And so uh, what, what they, everybody knows is that the discount is converted into a price according to this formula. And so um, uh, you might ask, well, is this an approximate formula? No, it's an exact formula. Uh, then you say, well, why didn't they divide by 365? Because I know there's 365 days in a year. Okay. Uh, well, the answer is, this goes way back. It's an old tradition. And they used to have to do this by hand. They had to divide by hand. And so they didn't like the number 365. So they thought, let's just round it to 360. And as long as everybody knows that's what we're doing, what difference does it make, right? OK, so that's what you're supposed to know. So if your dealer quotes you a discount rate of 2.51%, you know how to convert that into the price. And that's all that matters. All that really matters is the price you have to pay. Um, now, they also have something up here called the investment rate. Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Glad you. Uh, yeah, I'm sorry. That's the difference between one and 99.58. Yes. Thank you. Uh, uh, between 100 <laughs> and 99.58. Are, are you okay now? I'm sorry, I made the. <laughs> okay. Now the thing is to convert that into what is this other? There's, there's another interest rate up there called the investment rate. Uh, well, that's the that's supposed to be your percentage return on an annualized basis. Remember, this thing only runs for 60 days, and you could co compute your 60-day return, but people like to compare annual returns. It's, again, a tradition we have. Uh, there's nothing special about annual. That's the time it takes the Earth to go around the sun. 
but it doesn't have any relevance to finance, but uh, we are just accustomed to using that. So uh, uh, we, what we're going to do, however, is take account of another problem, and that is um, th th you might think that uh, uh, this quantity here is, is my uh, return, um, but you have to actually divide it by uh, the price, which is less than 100, to get a return. Uh, <coughs> you're not putting in $100 to this investment. You're putting in $99.58 for the <coughs> investment, and you're getting out the difference between 100 and 99.58. Uh, and so that is not, uh, 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 your, your return is actually higher than 2.51% on an annualized basis. So what we do, I'll, I'll show you how they got their number. Um, 2.563, uh, which is the, uh, the number you see under uh, investment rate, is equal to 1 all over 0.9958 minus 1 corrected for the number of days in a year. Um, and how do we do that correction? Uh, when I first tried this, I thought, fine, I'll, I'll multiply by 365 over 60. But I forgot that this is a leap year, <laughs> and so times 366 all over 60. So that's how you go from um, the discount yield, the discount rate, to the investment rate. Do you understand why we had to do this? Uh, the investment rate is telling you how much money you're really making on an annualized basis. And so it's very simple. I put in uh, 0.9958 for every dollar I got out. So my appreciation of my money is 1 over 0.9958, right? Subtract that by $1, which is what I put in, and that's how much money I made as, as a fraction of a dollar, right? All I have to do then is correct that for the number of days in a year. And so that's, that's what I did. That's how we go from the uh, discount rate to the investment rate. Now, you might ask, well, if we did 360 here, why don't we just do 360 over here? Well, it's one of the mysteries of Wall Street. Uh, they like to, when they're computing the investment yield, they want to be completely honest and not use any rules of thumb. Uh, so you have to understand that it's 360 here because that's just a convention and everybody knows that it's just the way we quote prices. Rather than say uh, 99 and 58 cents, we just quote the 2.51 and everybody knows how to convert. But when you ask for the investment rate, you want to know the truth. How much am I really getting? So they don't monkey around here. Also, they don't have to actually, you know, in the old days, they didn't actually have to compute the investment rate. If you were talking to your broker, if you go really old days, you'd send a boy running over to your broker. They didn't have telephones. <laughs> they used to have runners. <laughs> and the boy would go say, uh, we're, uh, we're offering to pay uh, a discount rate of 2.51. That was the formula. Um, and then anyone could do these calculations. They knew what it meant. Um, but um, this calculation wasn't done very frequently. That's just if you had wanted the satisfaction of knowing how much uh, money you're making. OK. So um, OK. So I think we pretty much explained. Well, there's another thing I wanted to say about treasury bills. Um, I used to have up here uh, a page. I used to take, instead of Treasury Direct, which is a website, I used to get a clipping from the Wall Street Journal that showed much the same information that you see on this chart, but it showed additional information that you won't find on Treasury Direct. It showed bid and asked for dealers. Now, you have to understand that Treasury has these auctions only on these dates. On uh, February 14, they only sold 60-day ones, nothing else. And on February 11, they sold only 13-week uh, ones and nothing else. All right? And so 
what if you want to buy a treasury bill on some other day? Well, you can go to Treasury Direct as an individual and buy a treasury bill, but it may not be the best place to buy. Uh, what you normally do is you go to a dealer, and a dealer is someone, a professional, who participated in the auction and bought these up to accumulate an inventory to then sell off to you, the customer. So normally you don't deal with Treasury Direct, you deal with a dealer. Okay? The Wall Street Journal calls around to the dealer, which has an inventory of all these different maturities, uh, and asks them for their bid and asked. Okay? And a dealer, that's what, what a dealer does is it maintains an inventory of, in this case, treasury bills, uh, and then it, um, it uh, stands ready to buy and sell. So the bid price is the, well, they don't quote, do it in terms of price, they do it in terms of discount. So the bid discount rate, there'd be two numbers for each. Uh, one is the bid, which is what they'll pay you um, for a treasury bill if you want to sell to them. Uh, and the ask is what you have to pay them uh, through this formula. Uh, 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 the formula is, uh, I could write it this way, price, price equals 100 minus this. Um, and so, uh, normally, when you have a dealer, the dealer uh, has a, uh, when, t when we talk in terms of price, the dealer has a asked, which is higher than the bid. Right? If you go to an antique dealer, maybe you're familiar, maybe, or maybe you've done this if you bought furniture for some apartment or something, the, the, the dealer will charge a higher price for you to buy the furniture than will give to you to, uh, to purchase the furniture from you. And that's how the dealer makes a difference. It's the difference between bid and asked is the, uh, is the profit for the dealer. And the bid asked spread is the profit for the dealer. So you can see these on the, the you can see the bid and asked on the Wall Street Journal. Uh, uh, and uh, it's interesting to look at it because you note that the bid asked spread, which is the difference between the bid and the ask for a dealer. Uh, is narrower in the more liquid securities. Uh, and some of the securities that are small and unimportant have a wide bid-ask spread. That means that it's, it's harder to make a market for it, so the dealer wants to charge more. Uh, but this doesn't show this here. Um, uh, unfortunately, the Wall Street Journal stopped carrying this. Um, and I thought this an interesting story about what goes on. Um, it's, uh, uh, the, the Wall Street Journal is the most influential financial publication in this country. Um, but it has been going through financial difficulties with the internet age. Uh, and in the last five years, the stock in Dow Jones Company has fallen by half. Uh, and what's happening? Well, I, I, there are many factors, but one important factor is the rise of the internet uh, has competed with. People used to buy the Wall Street Journal to get data like this, right? But you see how I completely bypassed the Wall Street Journal and I went to Treasury Direct. There's a million websites that give away financial data. So, uh, so the Wall Street Journal uh, was not doing as well. Uh, and do you know what happened uh, finally? Uh, well, what, I'll give this as a saga. They reduced the size of the newspaper in uh, 2005. It used to be a big broadsheet, and they made it smaller in 2005. And they, start, they keep cutting out data. There's less and less data in the Wall Street Journal. It used to be this big, thick thing. And you would go there every day to look up price, and everything was in there. But now the web is competing with it. So, so they, they're scaling down the size of the paper uh, and trying to survive. Um, and so. Uh, they created Wall Street Journal Online, which is uh, WSJ.com, uh, and they were trying to make money off of that, but people weren't willing to pay for it. You know how it is on the web. You can get so much for free. Why should I pay for WSJ.com? Uh, and so that wasn't working well. And so um, last year, about one year ago, they announced WallStreetJournal.com is absolutely free, and we're going to give away all the data basically all the data that used to be in the newspaper, free to anyone. Uh, and I thought that was great. 
uh, because now we can all get the Wall Street Journal without paying for it. But there's some problem with that. It's not economic. Uh, so let's not be too jubilant. Uh, what ended up happening is, do you know the, uh, the news that uh, Rupert Murdoch bought the Wall Street Journal uh, last fall? Uh, and he announced that uh, wallstreetjournal.wsj.com will no longer be free. And so this is the reality of the, of the world. Uh, I thought it was interesting if you look at uh, uh, Rupert Murdoch. Uh, this is finance. Uh, this may sound like an aside, but this is all finance. <laughs> Rupert Murdoch, uh, you may have heard of him, uh, is a huge newspaper baron who buys up newspapers all over the world. Uh, and uh, it's interesting, he's been at it. Uh, well, he, he's continuing what his father did. It, it take, to become the biggest <coughs> publishing a monolith in the world, it takes maybe a hundred years. So his father in Australia started buying up newspapers. Uh, his father was born in 1886. Um, and now Rupert Murdoch is continuing. He's now, Rupert Murdoch is uh, in, in his 70s and he's still buying newspapers. But he kind of makes them survive. And News Corp uh, doubled its price, that's his company, doubled in the last, uh, in the last five years. So you can see this is how the, the unseen ro ro role of finance. Wall Street Journal is a venerable newspaper and source of information about finance, but it's not making money. The world is changing and Wall Street Journal is flagging. So News Corp, whose price doubled when Wall Street Journals fell in half, eats up <laughs> and Wall Street Journal is gobbled up by the bigger, by the bigger company. So you can see why stock prices matter. The, 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 the News Corp's rising stock price was a sign that Rupert Murdoch had some idea how to, how to make money, and Wall Street Journal was not doing as well. So it got gobbled up. Uh, uh, the question is, what will happen to the Wall Street Journal now? Um, uh, so, uh, well, they have to make money. That's the real world. And so uh, Rupert Murdoch tends to bring papers around. I'm just going to go a little bit further on <laughs> Rupert Murdoch bought the Times of London in 1981. That was uh, 27 years ago. The Times of London is one of the most venerable newspapers of the world. And it was losing money fast, and it might have disappeared if M Murdoch hadn't taken over. Uh, but Murdoch um, turned it around, and it's still around. They turned it into a tabloid. <laughs> it was the most dignified newspaper in the world. Uh, and he kind of decided that in order to survive, they had to get a little bit more down to earth. Uh, so they reduced the size. So it looks like one of those like New York Daily News newspapers now. Uh, but it's still a, a great newspaper. Uh, they, he added celebrity gossip, to, which the London Times would never do in the past. But you've got to do it, right? That's the thing about the real world. And finance is very much about the real world. Uh, and so. Uh, Murdoch claims he will not uh, alter the editorial content of the Wall Street Journal. Uh, the thing that we see him doing is charging more, okay? But I guess we've got to allow that. So we may feel annoyed that we now have to pay to get on Wall Street Journal online. Um, but, um, but in the long run, we want the Wall Street Journal. And so, um, and so I guess that uh, we just have to accept that. So if you want to find, by the way, if you want to read the Wall Street Journal online at Yale, you can do it, no problem. You go to ABI Inform, which is one of the um, things that Yale subscribes to on your laptop, and it puts you right into the text of the Wall Street Journal. Uh, but it doesn't put you, as far as I can tell, into Wall Street Journal online. <laughs> so um, we have other, uh, lots of data sources that Yale subscribes to, and there's lots of free data sources. But uh, Wall Street Journal is not free. Anyway, um, I wanted to talk. So you understand now about a discount bond. It's, it's pretty simple, right? Um, but I just wanted to get the pricing formula. The critical thing about a discount bond is it pays no interest. Treasury bills in the United States are limited to one year out. But, well, that's the name of it. Um, so uh, we call a a. a, a an instrument of the U.S. Treasury with a maturity less than or up less than or equal to one year, we call that a bill. Um, and they used to be the only discount bonds issued by the U.S. government. 
Um, now they also have longer maturity called treasury strips, but uh, there, let, let me move though to the other. Uh, so we have the U.S. government issues bills, and so that's less than or equal to one year, and they pay no interest. They also have government issues notes, and that's from one to ten years, and bonds. This is just um, jargon. Uh, these are ten or more. Well, actually, more than ten. Um, I'll show you, uh, uh, from Treasury Direct, I have notes. Um, this should be greater than 10. Uh, these are the uh, recent auctions uh, of the Treasury of, of um, notes. Okay. Now, these are different from uh, bills, as I emphasize, because they pay interest. But they carry what's called a coupon. Um, and, um, and then we have the uh, bonds. Uh, and you see there aren't as many of these issued. The, we, we issue a lot of, there's a lot of auctions of treasury bills, uh, and there are comparatively fewer of bonds. Okay. Now, uh, okay, so uh, let's talk about a bond. Uh, a bond differs from a bill uh, in that it carries what's called a coupon, which I will denote by the letter C. Uh, and it has a principal, which uh, it pays out at the end of 100. Okay. Uh, of course, they would be larger denominations than 100, but by tradition, we speak of them as if they were uh, bonds that paid, you paid $100 to get. Okay. Now, another Wall Street tradition is that um, bonds pay a, a prince, they pay a coupon, they pay C over 2 every six months. So uh, the coupon is at, expressed as an annual amount. You get half of it every six months. Um, and so uh, the reason they call it coupons is that in the old days, you used to actually, when you bought a bond, there'd be a piece of paper. And the piece of paper would have attached to it uh, a lot of little coupons that you would clip. Uh, and each one, if it was a 20-year bond, there would be 40 coupons, one for each six-month period. And each one would have a date on it. And what you used to do is every six months, you'd pull out your bonds and you'd clip the coupons with a pair of scissors and you'd take them to a bank and they would give you cash for your coupons. Uh, so we still call them coupons. But now we don't do it. We do things electronically. You don't have to clip coupons anymore. But if you want to see uh, bonds that the, as they used to look, uh, with their coupons. Uh, there are a number of them at the International Center for Finance down the street here, um, on that way, <laughs> um, with their coupons still attached. So the, uh, they've got a lot of, uh, uh, Will Getzman and Garrett Roenhurst are collectors of old bonds. And they've got lots of bonds with their coupons still attached. You know what that means when they're framed there on the wall with their coupons still attached? It means the company went bankrupt and never paid. Otherwise, the coupons would have been clipped. So it's actually, uh, our International Center for Finance is sort of a museum for defaulted bonds. <laughs> the, the ones that are beautiful for framing are the ones that failed. Uh, so you can see all the coupons. Some of them have some of the coupons clipped, and then, then they stop, and you know there was bad news uh, when they stopped clipping them. We still call them coupons. So if you have a bond uh, with a, um, uh, interest rate uh, of uh, 4.375 cents. That's a, not an easy one to divide by two, but you would, you would get half of that every six months uh, until maturity. Uh, and so we have to ask then, uh, how do we get the, um, uh, how do we get the price and the yield from this? Um, so what we do is we take the 
uh, interest rate, which I call R, and plug it into a formula, uh, which I didn't, uh, I didn't actually do the arithmetic check, but uh, to check their number. But the price, um, OK, the price is just the, uh, the present value of the coupons uh, at the interest rate, R. So the price of the bond is the present discounted value of coupons and principal at, uh, at rate R. Now, you have to understand that when you buy a bond, if you buy it at issue, you get the first coupon in six months, the second coupon in one year, the third coupon in 18 months, and the last coupon you get at the maturity date. So that means, what is the stream of payments? You get C over 2 in six months, C over 2 again in a year, C over 2 again in 18 months, uh, and that continues until the last date, the maturity date, when you get 100 plus C over 2. Okay? And so the price is just the present value uh, of, the, of that stream discounted at the interest rate. Uh, and so the formula uh, can also be written, uh, if you expand it out, Price is equal to uh, C over 2 times 1 over R over 2 um, which is the uh, what the console formula if this were applied uh, uh, to an infinite stream minus 1 all over 1 plus r over 2 to the 2t power times 1 over r over 2. Uh, I'm making, let's make sure I've got this right. Uh, plus 100 times 1 all over 1 plus r over 2 to the 2t power. Okay, This should be obvious, if I did that right, this should be obvious from uh, what you learned about in present value formulas. Um, if you had a perpetuity which paid c over 2 forever, you already know from the perpetuity formula that the value of that would be c over 2 divided by r over 2. Um, if r over 2 is the discount rate. But it's not forever, because it terminates at after, uh, after two t periods uh, of six month interval each. So that you, you want to subtract off the value of a perpetuity that uh, starts after two t six month intervals. And so this is the present value of the uh, perpetuity that starts uh, after 2t six months intervals. Then you want to add the, the present value of the principal. Okay, and so that's the formula. Uh, and that's another conventional formula that goes from interest rate um, to price of the, uh, of the security. Um, okay. Uh, so, um, Okay. Now I wanted to talk about the uh, term structure of interest rates, uh, and that's my next plot here. Uh, that's the term structure as of now on the chart. 
we've identified the uh, prices and yields of, of bonds of various maturities, uh, how do the uh, prices and yields look uh, at various points in time? And so I've got here the term structure. Well, the term structure is the a plot of uh, yield to maturity against time to maturity. Uh, this is um, January of this year, before the Fed cut interest rates. Uh, and this is the term structure. I've got uh, the federal funds rate is the shortest interest rate. It's an overnight rate. It was at 4% at that time. Uh, and then uh, there was a sharp drop. The three-month uh, Treasury bill rate is shown there. It was much lower. It was under 3%. And then the, uh, uh, the then so the term structure was downward sloping until about two and a half years, and then it was upward sloping. The interesting question from the standpoint of economic theory is, why did it have that funny shape? Uh, I wanted to uh, compare it with other um, other uh, examples of the term structure uh, recently. Uh, this is the term structure just a short while ago, December 2006. Very different, right? The uh, federal funds rate was uh, five and a half, and then the whole term structure all the way, almost all, well, there's this funny, <laughs> funny glitch here between uh, uh, three months and one year, but then it just continued to decline. That's a strongly downward sloping term structure. Uh, and this is another example, not so long ago. This is December 2003. Now the term structure was pretty much upward sloping everywhere. So uh, at that time, the Fed had cut the federal funds rate to 1%. We had very low short rates. Uh, and the three-month Treasury bill rate was about the same at 1%. But uh, going further out, the term structure just kept rising. It's one of the questions of economics is what determines the term structure. You have to understand that it's determined in the market. The, uh, the, the Fed has these auctions, but it auctions them off at what price the public will pay. So the Fed doesn't determine the term structure. Uh, neither do the dealers determine the term structure. The dealers have to buy and sell at prices that are in the market. It has to stay relevant to the market. So nobody really knows where these interest rates come from, because no one person sets them. If you're a dealer, you've got to keep your bid asked at market. Otherwise, you'll get only uh, one side or the other, right? Uh, you'll be selling uh, too cheaply, or you'll be buying too dearly. Uh, you gotta, you've got to do it so you're right in the middle, so that the market is in the middle. So nobody really sees the reasons for this. It's all a question of theory. So um, we have to think uh, a little bit about theory. So um, the term structure is one of the most interesting things in economics because it shows the price of time uh, at various maturities. So in, in uh, 2003, uh, time was almost free uh, out three months. Uh, it didn't, if, you, if you needed more time to get some business done, you'd have to borrow, but you only have to pay 1% a year. Uh, that would be like a quarter of 1% to postpone your payment by another year. So time was really cheap. Uh, but, uh, but if you wanted to postpone it over seven years or so, time got a lot more expensive. So why is this? And why is the price of time changing? Uh, one thing to do is to just ask, uh, to go back and ask, what really are um, um, the reasons for interest? Uh, and I wanted to talk uh, about the theory of interest uh, as presented by uh, Professor Irving Fisher at Yale, who uh, is famous for having exposited that. And I, fa I imagine he did it at this very blackboard, uh, because as I said, he had his office in this building. Uh, uh, and uh, he didn't die until the uh, 1940s, so he must have been. And this building was, this room goes back to the 30s. So um, um, 
he had a diagram which illustrated what uh, is the ultimate cause of interest. Uh, and uh, it helps us to think about this diagram whenever we try to understand the term structure. So he di what his diagram, uh, th this is the famous Irving Fisher diagram, uh, uh, depicted uh, a, a world in which there, the, there's only <coughs> one period. There's today uh, on this axis, and uh, tomorrow, well, I shouldn't say tomorrow, that suggests one day. Uh, next period on this axis, uh, let's say it's one year, okay? And I'm going to actually plot on this axis um, a person's income this year. Uh, I should say income today on this axis. And on this uh, income next period. So for each person, there is a point representing my income today and my income next period. Let's assume that I know what I'm earning next year, okay? There is actually uncertainty about it, all right? So if I draw this down, this, this point is t this year's income down here, and this point here is uh, next year's income. I, I, I sh I'll use Y for income. This is Y today, and this is Y next period. Um, so a person has a budget constraint if the person can borrow and lend uh, at the interest rate. Uh, and the budget constraint is a straight line through this point uh, with a slope of 1 plus r. So I'll try to draw this line. OK. That should be a straight line. <laughs> it doesn't look that straight, because I was running out of room up here. Uh, but you see, that's a, that's a straight line, OK? Uh, this point here, then, is the present value of your income, right? So it's y today uh, plus y next period all over 1 plus r. Okay, and what's this point up here? This point up here is the terminal value of my income, uh, and so the uh, the upper point is uh, y today times one plus r plus y next. Now, in the ideal world where you can borrow and lend freely. Uh, an individual could choose consumption along any point on this, di on this line, right? I could consume all of my income. If I borrow against my future income, I could. There's a problem here of starvation. If I consume it all this year, I will be starving. I don't see how I can earn income next year. Uh, but in principle, that's what Irving Fisher said. Or I could just not consume anything this year, and I could wait until next year and consume the terminal value. I would take my income this year. Invest it at the interest rate, and it would turn into y today times 1 plus r, and then I get income next year. So I could consume all that. So I can consume at any point along that line as well. I could consume at today's income, or I could consume here, or I could consume down here, right? If I consume less than my income today, I'm saving, uh, and my consumption would be lower this year. Am I doing that right? No, if I'm, if, if I'm saving this year, my consumption would be less than my income. So my consumption might be here, uh, and I would then have more next year. Okay? And that's, so each individual reaches a decision. Each individual has a, uh, a, a, an income uh, point and decides how much to consume based on the budget constraint. Um, now, the interest rate in Irving Fisher's world has to equate supply and demand in the market for debt. Each person who wants to, uh, to, to borrow has to be met by somebody else who wants to lend. Uh, and so the interest rate that we have in society is the compromise. It's the interest rate that equates the, that clears the market for loans. 
uh, and that interest rate um, determines the market interest rate. So that nobody can see the interest rate, why the interest rate's at the level it is um, uh, in the market, because nobody can see all these individuals. But that's why the interest rate gets determined and is, uh, is um, uh, in equilibrium, why the interest rate uh, clears. Uh, well, it's, it's a mysterious phenomenon because it's a market phenomenon, and each person only sees his or her own contribution to the market and not the whole market. Irving Fisher also drew on the curve a production possibility frontier for society, which he made downward curve. This is production possibility frontier. And that is a curve, you've seen these before in economics, that says uh, how the production of our society can, um, can produce different combinations of income this year and next year. If there were no credit markets, society, everyone would have to be on the production possibility frontier. There'd be no other choice. But if we have credit markets, then people can individually choose to be on, off the production possibility frontier and at a higher level of consumption than otherwise would. And so you might have some people up here who are saving and other people down here who are dissaving. Uh, and the production would be operating at the middle. Uh, so that is Irving Fisher's diagram uh, in a nutshell. But uh, I think it's, uh, um, it's uh, so what, it, what does it say about the term structure? It says that at different horizons, everything on this diagram is different. So uh, the production possibility at frontier at different horizons is in different places. The budget constraint, uh, it's going to have different uh, slope to it, and, and preferences will be different over this horizon between consumption then and consumption now. So you, it, it doesn't, this theory doesn't say a whole lot about what the term structure will look like, but it, uh, it uh, suggests that it's determined by the interplay of lots of economic factors. Uh, so, all right, so we're. Um, I wanted to talk about a, uh, a couple of other basic concepts in economics of interest rates. Uh, and one of them is the forward rate. And the other one is inflation indexed interest rates. So um, forward rates. I wrote an article, I wrote a, a, a survey article years ago about uh, the term structure of interest rates. And I wanted to find out who was the uh, originator of the term forward rate. Uh, so I asked my graduate student research assistant to research the whole literature and find out where did the word forward rate come from. And my graduate student came back and said, it seems to have been Sir John Hicks in London in his 1931, no, 1939 book a value in capital. All right. <clears throat> but um, th uh, this is another aside, but I think it's <laughs> motivational. Uh, so uh, I said, are you sure that J.R. Hicks invented the term forward rate? And he said, how can I be sure, right? I mean, I've looked through everything. I can't find any earlier reference. Um, and he said, I think it's J.R. Hicks. Um, but then I, I was talking it over with another graduate student. He said, well, if you want to find out, why don't you ask J.R. Hicks? <laughs> and so I said, wait a minute. Is that guy still alive? And he said, I think he is. Um, so I found out he was living in London. Lord Hicks, <laughs> I guess. He got uh, knighted for his contribution. And I wrote him a letter. And I said, basically, did you invent forward rates? <laughs> then I didn't get any response for like three months. Uh, and then to my surprise, I got a handwritten letter in kind of a trembling handwriting. <laughs> and uh, I still have it. I should, uh, I could put it up on the screen, actually. Uh, and uh, he said, my apology, he's very polite and uh, 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 diplomatic. He said, my apologies for not answering your letter, for, but my health is poor. And, uh, but it was a long letter. He said, I'm trying to remember where I got the idea. 
And he said, I think it probably came from some of our coffee hours at the London School of Economics in the 1920s. <laughs> and he said, we were discussing that. And he said, I thought it was in a book that my wife and I translated from the Swedish uh, in the 1930s. But he said, I looked and it's not there. And so he said, I guess maybe it is my idea. <laughs> or I was the first person to write it up. Um, and then he died shortly thereafter, so I got to him just in time. Uh, so I, I thought I would uh, describe forward rates uh, in terms of the uh, coffee hour at the London School of Economics in the 20s. <laughs> okay. So uh, this is J.R. Hicks talking. Uh, so the year is 1925, okay, uh, and we're talking about investing in discount bonds, um, and we're going to put 100 pounds, okay. Um, now suppose, uh, okay, the, the idea that Hicks invented is that they're implicit in the term structure. There are future interest rates already quoted. I showed you the term structure. I showed you a one-year treasury bill rate for, for uh, right now, and uh, that's not right now, but uh, uh, you can see I have a one-year and a two-year treasury bill rate. The idea of a forward rate is that implicit in that term structure is also a quote for the one-year rate one year hence. Because if you look at the two-year rate, can't you infer back what interest rates are going to be in one year? Because the two-year rate is, um, you've got the one-year rate and the two-year rate, so between the two, what's left? It's the, the difference between those two somehow reflects what interest rates will be between one and two. So what Hicks said, okay, this is a coffee hour conversation at the London School of Economics. He said, it's right now 1925, but if you want to invest or borrow uh, in 1926, uh, I can do it for you. I, I can lock in the interest rate right now. Okay. Okay. So let's say, okay, I expect, suppose I expect to get 100 pounds in um, 1926. Here we are sitting in 1925. And I want to today in 1925 lock in the investment return that I will get when I invest that 100 pounds. Okay. Okay. And so what we want to do, this is what Hicks uh, discovered. I can do the following transaction to lock in, in 1925, the interest rate between 1926 and 27. So here we are sitting in 1925. I'm going to buy in 25, this amount of two period bonds, two year bonds, 1 plus R2 squared uh, over 1 plus R1. Okay, these will mature and be worth $100 uh, in 26. I'm going to short how much? Um, I'm going to short um, short one one period bond. This is the number uh, this is the number of bonds I have to buy. Okay. And so uh, Let's analyze this trend. That's all I have to do, and I've locked in the uh, interest rate. Okay. R1 is the, the yield on the one-period bond, uh, and R2 is the yield on the two-period bond. So the, the, the price of the two-period bond is 1 all over 1 plus R2 squared, and the price of the one-period bond is 1 all over 1 plus R1. So if I buy this amount of, one peri of two period bonds, how much does it cost me? It costs me 1 over 1 plus R1. And if I short uh, the uh, one period bond, it cancels out. So I've made no net purchase in, in 1925, right? I bought a number of two period bonds such that the value of my purchase exactly equals the proceeds that I get from shorting 
the one period bond. So I've made a zero, uh, transa a, a zero wealth transaction. It hasn't affected my portfolio, uh, uh, my cash position at all. What happens then? In, so that's in 1925. So uh, there's no cash flow, <laughs> no cash flow at all. Okay. In 26, what happens? Well, in 26, um, the uh, I've shorted the one period bond, and so um, I have to pay out one dollar now. That, but that's exactly what I wanted to do. Remember, I said I'm doing this because I expect to have uh, uh, well 100 pounds. I said one dollar. Uh, I'm going to have to pay out 100 pounds because this one period bond worth 100 pounds principal is coming due. So I have to pay it out. Uh, but that's what I wanted to do because I said I have 100 pounds to invest. Uh, nothing happens to the uh, uh, to the uh, two period bond because it just continues to mature. So in 26, in 1926, I pay 100 pounds. Okay. What happens in 1927? Now, uh, what happens is uh, I now get the maturity of this bond. Um, so um, uh, what I get, I've, I've, I have, um, I have purchased this number of pounds. So I'm going to get a hundred pounds times that amount there, the number of bonds, one plus r two squared all over one plus r one. So you can see that by doing this transaction, I have locked in a return between 26 and 27. I did it in 25, but I've got, the, I've got it set up so that I will pay 100 pounds in 26, and I'll get this in 27. So he calls the forward rate. Equals 1 plus r2 squared all over 1 plus r1. All right? This is Hick's discovery. I mean, you might say this should have been obvious to someone, but it had never been written up r well before. So what Hick said is that in these term structures, you don't just have today's interest rates. This is a map. Actually, I, I've just showed the one period ahead, one period forward rate. But you could do it over any combination. And you can get forward rates of any maturity at any future date. Uh, and so, um, so that was Hick's insight. And it comes back then to Hick's <coughs> book, uh, Value and Capital, in 1939. He said that we should think that the, the, the simplest story of the term structure of interest rates, which he expounded there, is that forward rates equal expected future interest rates. And so that means that uh, in the simple, it's, the, it's called the expectations theory of the term structure. It says that the forward rate, which you can compute from today's newspaper uh, or, or from today's website, uh, you can compute the forward rates for all future dates. And what he says is those f forward rates are what people think interest rates will be in the future. And that's called the expectations theory of the term structure. Forward rates equal expected future spot rates. So if you look at the December 2003, what's going on? It's very clear, and that is the Fed had just cut interest rates to 1%. It was unusual. It was much talked about. People didn't expect that to hold. And so, the, so people thought, well, it's going to still be down at 1% uh, maybe in three months. So you can see the, uh, uh, the term structure doesn't go up between uh, overnight and three months. But they are expecting that the Fed is eventually, and they were right, of course, in this case, the Fed is eventually going to raise rates. So the, the upward sloping term structure means that the forward rates are at higher levels. Uh, and so uh, that's the expectations theory. Uh, fine, uh, but Hicks also uh, talked about um, another theory in his 1939 book, uh, which is. Uh, there's the expectations theory, uh, 
But there's also uh, a liquidity premium theory, to get more chalk here. Uh, and this is the theory that uh, there's, a, there's risk uh, in longer term bonds, and so that uh, there's, a, there's a tendency for upward sloping term structure. There's a tendency for upward slope, even if expectations are flat. So that according to the expectations theory augmented with uh, liquidity preference, um, the um, uh, if, if, if the uh, th this this strongly upward sloping term structure in 2003 would reflect two things. One is that people expected interest rates to go up, and secondly, that uh, uh, interest rates, uh, uh, longer term bonds are riskier, and so uh, there's also another effect pushing interest rates up. The last thing I want to talk about is just. Uh, I'm, I'm running out of time here, and I wanted to mention this before you uh, midterm exam, which, which is next to Monday, uh, and covers everything through this lecture. Uh, something about inflation and interest rates. Uh, inflation, we'll call that uh, pi, the inflation rate. Uh, the inflation rate is pi, so right now it's something like 2 percent, or it's a little bit higher last year, but maybe, maybe it'll be 2 percent going forward. Um, the real interest rate computed from nominal rates is equal to 1 plus the nominal rate divided by 1 plus the inflation rate. So it corrects for inflation. So if you have an interest rate, this is approximately equal to uh, no, 1 plus the real interest rate. 1 plus the real interest rate is equal to 1 plus the nominal interest rate divided by 1 plus the rate of inflation. So we would say the real interest rate equals the nominal rate, approximately equals the nominal rate minus the inflation rate. Uh, so if we have, um, right now, if, uh, if we go back to our current term structure, well, this isn't completely, you know, if you look at the current term structure, it's interesting. Look how, uh, this is as of earlier this year, the, the, uh, the federal funds rate was at around 4 percent, and it has this huge drop in the term structure, and then it starts to be upward sloping. Why is that? That's because on the date that I got this term structure, everybody knew the Fed was cutting rates. And they got it exactly right. The Fed was cutting rates to 3 percent. They knew it was coming, but not today. Uh, so, um, uh, okay, so uh, right now uh, we have a uh, federal funds rate of about 3 percent and an inflation rate of around 3 percent. So right now the real interest rate is close to zero. Finally, I just wanted to say that we have also a kind of bond called an indexed bond, uh, which is uh, an, a bond whose coupons are indexed to inflation. Uh, and with an indexed bond, you don't have to do this calculation to get the real rate. The, the yield to maturity on an indexed bond is already in real terms because the coupons are indexed to inflation. Uh, and my final slide is a plot, a picture of the first index bond. Uh, uh, this is issued by the state of Massachusetts. I actually own this bond. I bought it for $1,000 on a, on a website because I was interested in index bonds. I could have I brought it to class and showed it to you. But this was issued in, during the Revolutionary War to, to uh, help finance the war. And what happened was the U.S. government, or the Massachusetts government, had created high inflation during the war, and nobody wanted to lend money to it. So they create here a, a, a price index. It says the price index contained uh, uh, this amount of beef, this amount of sheep's wool, this, wool, this amount of sole leather, and this amount of corn. 
That was, a con that was the first consumer price index ever used for financial contracts. But we now have something else called the consumer price index. Uh, this bond uh, was paid off. It, it, the US, the Massachusetts didn't fail to pay on it uh, in uh, 1784, uh, I guess. Uh, and, uh, but anyway, so uh, index bonds are about 15% of the US national, I'm sorry, about 8% of the US national debt, about 15% of the UK national debt. And they are very important, but still a minority of all of our uh, corporate, of our fixed incomes. OK, so that concludes this lecture. And uh, I, uh, I, I won't be here on Monday, but we'll have our lecture in this classroom uh, uh, on Monday. <laughs>